As a rule, veterinarians are more comfortable adopting acupuncture as a therapeutic modality than any other alternative treatment. And that's probably because there's an extensive scientific backing behind the practice of acupuncture. This lecture reviews the science behind how veterinary acupuncture works. Belief in acupuncture wasn't always there. At one point, people assumed that acupuncture couldn't possibly exist because acupuncture points didn't have any unique histological structures. Now we know that most acupuncture points are consistent in their makeup, but they employ structures that are found in all of the body tissues, including afferent and efferent nerve endings, blood vessels, mast cells, and collagen fibers. We'll talk a little bit more about how these work later on in this lecture. The acupuncturist inserts fine metallic needles into these points to cause a desired healing effect, and when electrical current is applied to the needles, then these therapeutic effects tend to last longer. We can divide the effects and research into acupuncture's effects into two main categories, supersegmental mechanisms and effects that are mediated by the brain, and that result in both analgesia and the relief of inflammation, and segmental effects that are mediated at the level of the spinal cord. That's also a major mechanism for the relief of pain, and in addition, the spinal cord appears to be involved in another important effect of acupuncture, which is the relation of blood flow. And it's the regulation of blood flow that very much more than likely gives acupuncture its healing benefits that go well beyond simply pain relief. Before we dig into those mechanisms, though, I wanted to take a few minutes and just look at the clinical trials and what they have to say about acupuncture's efficacy. And we're going to look at the highest level of evidence regarding whether acupuncture works. We're going to evaluate or look into those systematic reviews of clinical trials. It's surprising that despite the broad interest amongst veterinarians in acupuncture and its use, compelling evidence of its efficacy according to these systematic reviews is surprisingly lacking. Nevertheless, those same reviews cite encouraging evidence exists for the management of pain, diarrhea, spinal cord injury, hyperadrenocorticism, surprisingly, lung function, hepatitis, and, interestingly, rumen acidosis. The human trial research results are a little more compelling, such that the National Institute of Health concluded in 1997 that there was sufficient evidence of acupuncture's value to expand its use into conventional medicine and to encourage further studies of its physiology and clinical value. Research support has only grown since that time. Here are some of the conditions that those systematic reviews of human clinical trials showed acupuncture to be effective for, including chronic pain, surprisingly obesity, depression, acne, tension headaches, stroke rehabilitation, knee pain, osteoarthritis in general, and low back pain. Not only is it effective, but it's equivalent to drug therapy according to these systematic reviews of clinical trials in the treatment of insomnia, post-operative nausea and vomiting, and the prevention of migraine headaches. Inconclusive effects were seen in systematic reviews of clinical trials relating to allergic rhinitis, dysmenorrhea, erectile dysfunction, vascular dementia, and smoking sensation. Ironically, there were some clinical trials in which no effect was seen, including fibromyalgia and intraoperative analgesia. Why is that? Ironic. It's because the use of acupuncture and intraoperative analgesia was really what brought acupuncture into the limelight and sparked the development of many effective analgesic methods based on research into how acupuncture works. Most famously, this includes the use of TENS to relieve pain. Lack of analgesic effects in trials, therefore, has to point to some significant problem in the trial design. Here's one potential problem when we compare acupuncture to placebo, that is, to the needling of sham acupuncture points. Many studies, clinical trials, 
showed that acupuncture achieved pain benefits that were no better than needling non-points. And therefore, it was assumed that there was a placebo effect to the pain relief. The patient believed themselves better, but wasn't truly better so far as pain relief was concerned. This was quite a confounding variable until recent studies using functional magnetic resonance imaging and positron emission tomography show that sham acupuncture isn't a placebo. It actually works as an effective analgesic. Here you can see three functional magnetic resonance images using positron emission tomography. On the left side, you have the control. Say somebody stamps on their foot, and you can see the somatosensory cortex light up together with the thalamus and hypothalamus as those pain signals are processed. Now the middle picture is what happens when a very well-chosen acupuncture point is applied at the same time as that pain stimulus. Note the lack of activity in the somatosensory cortex as the pain sensation is considerably dampened. We'll talk about the mechanisms that do that shortly. But look at the right diagram. You see how little or how much fewer somatosensory signals are being processed compared to the diagram on the left. The diagram on the right is sham acupuncture. So clearly it's having a pain dampening effect. Maybe not as good as deliberately chosen acupuncture points, but certainly it is having an effect uh, beyond uh, the control patient on the left where no acupuncture treatment of any kind is being administered. So there really isn't a sham acupuncture point. As soon as you needle anywhere on the body, you begin to invoke uh, pain dampening mechanisms. How does a really well chosen acupuncture point work? For that, we need to look into the neurology of pain sensation just a little bit. There are three first order afferent neurons that are nociceptive. First order means they are the first neuron that's stimulated when pain occurs and they carry the signal to the spinal cord at which point they synapse with second order neurons that then do something with that pain signal. So the neurons that are carrying signals into the spinal cord are A alpha and A beta fibers both of which are myelinated and C fibers which are unmyelinated. Myelinated fibers are fast conducting and you have those for a reason. If you reach out to touch a hot stove and you burn yourself, that fast conduction of that pain sensation to your body and to the brain ensures that you'll pull your hand away quickly and mitigate the effects of that noxious stimulus as quickly as possible. A beta fibers are myelinated and likewise conduct signals quickly, but they're not nociceptive. What they seem to be there to do is to reduce the pain following some sort of injury. They have lower thresholds of stimulation than A alpha fibers, but they synapse on the interneurons and inhibit the passage of pain signals stimulated by A alpha fibers. Effectively then, when you stimulate an A beta fiber, it closes the gate to further pain signal transmission from A alpha fiber. Essentially, they're a mechanism of the body saying, okay, you burned your hand and it's sore, but we can't let this get in the way of doing what we're doing out here and surviving. In transcutaneous electrical stimulation, these non-nociceptive A beta fibers are selectively stimulated using particular frequencies, and this then is the basis of TANS, the analgesic technology, which was directly inspired by the earliest investigations of acupuncture's pain relieving effects. This slide graphically depicts that spinal gating mechanism. In this slide, you see what happens with normal pain sensation. Notice the incoming signal from the A alpha fiber. That results in a second order neuron being activated, which in turn conducts this pain signal to the opposite side of the spinal cord and then up to the thalamus and the somatosensory cortex. Here's what happens with spinal gating. We have our neural input from A alpha fibers, but let's say you're rubbing the painful spot of which you just burned yourself or somehow traumatized yourself. That stimulated A beta fibers 
to work as well, relatively easily. And those A beta fibers then dampen the nerve signal going to the opposite side of the spinal cord and up to the thalamus, and the pain signal from the A alpha fiber is lost. This mechanism the body has for trying to calm down a sensation of pain once the damage is done is one of the mechanisms invoked by acupuncture. Acupuncture stimulates A beta fibers relatively easily, sending their pain signals up to where they can dampen out any pain signals coming from the A alpha fibers. What about the C fibers? These are unmyelinated and they conduct at slow speeds. They result in aching and throbbing and burning sorts of pains. They're processed, those signals, by a different part of the cortex and so they can sometimes be a little harder to pin down exactly where the pain is coming from. Pain from C fibers, which really means pain that's been around in your body for longer than two weeks, is stimulated by inflammatory compounds. That's what niggles these nociceptive C fibers and causes them to be polarized. Substance P is one compound that depolarizes C fibers. Platelet aggregating factor is another. There are lots of, of cytokines that have this influence. Unfortunately, the gate mechanism doesn't work to dampen the signals from C fibers because it utilizes different pathways in the spinal cord and not the same interneurons that A beta fibers synapse on. So how is pain relieved from C fibers? Descending inhibition is the name of the mechanism that helps to modulate the sensation of pain from C fibers. It certainly also modulates the sensation of pain from A alpha fibers as well. However, the whole mechanism is there to help an animal adapt to chronic pain from an inflammatory process that's just not going away and let that organism function and not have its survival be jeopardized. When you put an acupuncture needle into an acupuncture point, A beta fibers are stimulated more so than A alpha and those nerve signals produced by that acupuncture stimulus travel to the brain together with the sensation from the C fiber. Here you can see the sensation from the C fiber and the A beta fiber coming in, both of them entering the spinal cord and then moving up the spinal cord to the periaqueductal gray region. This signal from A beta fibers then stimulates the production of endogenous opioids within the brain that certainly have a pain relieving sensation in and of themselves. In addition, we have a signal moving down the spinal cord to where pain from C fibers is coming in and this fiber is involved in a transmission of that C fiber pain signal are then interfered with or dampened so that the pain sensation from C fibers subsides. All these mechanisms that we've been talking about are enhanced by the use of electroacupuncture. So much so that you can actually achieve intraoperative analgesia. You do need to provide that electrical stimulation for about 30 minutes though to key acupuncture points in order to affect that intraoperative analgesia. In all cases, analgesia will disappear within minutes to a day of discontinuing that acupuncture treatment and yet Clinical trials of acupuncture show enduring relief of even chronic pain. How is that possible to relieve chronic pain on an enduring basis if you're not getting acupuncture all the time? There really is only one answer. Acupuncture must also be anti-inflammatory.